finally, we arrived after planning and saving and a number of COVID delays. We found a week when the five of us could head west for a vacation. The Pacific Ocean, an ocean we had never visited, beckoned. Its warmer waters, its weightier waves invited us in. And it was a perfect, absolutely perfect summer day. The kids and I hit the water with boogie boards and we rode the waves for a good 45 minutes. Sharon was hanging out on the beach, finishing off her ninth mojito. <laughs> that's, God, that's, that's an exaggeration, because one, one would do her in, but. <laughs> Talia went back to the beach, followed by Matan, and after Ari took his uh, boogie board back in, I stayed out to enjoy a few more waves and have them push me back to shore. But the waves grew a little bit larger and larger, and then suddenly a riptide pulled me away from the beach. I wasn't far out, maybe about 100, 125 feet, but nonetheless, I realized I really, really should get back to the shore. But as I was swimming back in, the water kept pulling me back. And whichever way I went, I wasn't getting anywhere. I was getting a little bit tired. A small feeling of panic set in inside of me. And then fear crept in. I was alone in the water and struggling to get above the waves and I couldn't see another person, another face. Should I start screaming for help? That would be a little bit embarrassing. Was I actually really in danger? I thought I could still get back. And then suddenly these three larger and larger waves came one after the other, and I was really struggling. And I was scared, really scared. I know you're looking a little scared for me. It's OK. I'm standing right here. I don't want to give away the ending, but. <laughs> Going back to that experience, it was one when I felt afraid and alone. We all live our lives alone. There is a fundamental loneliness to our existence. While we're usually blessed with parents, some of us enjoy the blessings of siblings, friends, partners, and children, we are still alone. We live in our own minds. We think our own thoughts. Each night when we go to bed, we're left to reflect Sometimes we're kept up at night ruminating. Unfortunately, many of us, including me, can get stuck in this cycle of insomnia. And at night, sometimes that loneliness can haunt us. We come into this world alone, and we leave it alone. But while all that's true, we cannot actually survive by ourselves. Beginning at birth, our very survival depends on other people. And that dependence continues on for many years. We seek our mother's face. We are yearning to be seen, yearning to survive. If we go back to the beginning of the Torah, we can appreciate this understanding. Chapter 2 of Rashid of Genesis, in the second creation narrative, we are told that the Adam is created from the Adama. Literally, it would be something like the earthling is created from the earth. 
this human being is then placed in the Garden of Eden with unlimited food and water, which didn't depend on rain, which, as we all know, in the water-parched Middle East is not a small thing. The land, we are told, even contains precious stones. All of these resources means that Adam, this first human being, does not have to even break a sweat working or farming. Carefree days in the Garden of Eden, literally. But the garden isn't perfect. Even though God's assessment has been that the garden is tov, it's good. Everything is actually, in some places, tov ma'od. It's very good. But suddenly the Holy One declares that actually it's lo tov. It's not so good. Lo tov heyot ha'adam levado eselo ezer kenegdo. It's not so good for this or any human being to be alone. I will make a fitting helper for him. Now, there's a great number of midrashim, of rabbinic commentaries, and one that I want to point out intriguingly opens up this vignette. Rabbi Shmuel Bar Nachmani taught that the first human being was androgynous, that this person had male characteristics, physical characteristics on one side and female characteristics on the other. Two faces, but they could not see each other because they were both facing out. Instead of the common understanding that God took a rib out of this first person, Rabbi Shmuel understands the word sela not as rib, but as side which is actually the translation in every other part of the Tanakh, of the Hebrew Bible. So we see that two sides of this first person are split, becoming two separate people that can love and hug and support each other. And they can see each other's faces. Seeing someone's face has such power to comfort. Years ago, when I spent a summer working as a chaplain in a hospital, I came into the room, into a room to visit an older woman. I explained that I was the rabbi, and she said, you're the rabbi? Are things that bad? <laughs> I explained that, no, 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 everything's fine, you're still stable, and we started to talk. I visited her a number of times, and after a month, she got better, and she was being discharged. Thanking me, she said, I cannot tell you how lonely it has been to be here, but when your face would come into the room, it changed my entire mood. Just the sight of another person can change one's emotional state, especially when we are ill or lonely. That's why Rabbi Acha Bar Hanina taught in the Talmud that when you visit someone who is sick, you take away one sixtieth of their illness. Now, I don't know if Rabbi Acha meant it literally or not, but we cannot usually maybe change the, all the physical illness, but it's clear that when you visit someone you can lift their spirits. And that huge emotional uplift maybe can change the course of what they're experiencing. We're not abandoned. We're not alone. As humans, we yearn to see another human face. Looking into someone else's eyes can be intense. It can deepen a moment as nothing else can. In a modern love piece in the New York Times, Mandy Patron explains, the author, she experiments with the 36 questions that lead to love. 
demonstrating that closeness and intimacy can be accelerated by two people asking each other a series of specific questions of increasing, they're kind of increasingly personal questions. And she writes that this mutual vulnerability then fosters closeness. And the final task in this exercise is to stare into your partner's eyes for four minutes, four minutes. Sharon and I tried it yesterday. We started cracking up after 30 seconds. But Catron did it. She writes, I've skied steep slopes and hung from a rock face by a short length of rope. But staring into someone's eyes for four minutes was one of the most thrilling and terrifying experiences of my life. I spent the first couple of minutes just trying to breathe properly. There was a lot of nervous smiling until eventually we settled in. The real crux of the moment was not just that I was seeing someone, really seeing someone, but that I was actually seeing someone really see me. Once I embraced the terror of this realization and gave it time to subside, I arrived at somewhere unexpected. Reflecting on this seeing, the great psalmist, the author of Psalm 27, writes about God transferring this need to see someone. The author says to God, my heart says to you, God, seek my face. It's your face, Adonai, that I seek. And please do not turn your face away from me. Now, I read this psalm going back to people, not simply about God, about seeing God, or about receiving God's protection, but it's about our connections, our connections to others. We know we cannot see God or God's face, but maybe, just maybe, we can really see the face of another. Perhaps it's not even a complete look, not the full intensity of another person, but just a glimmer, a hint. While we cannot know the depths of another's soul, we yearn for that intimacy. Over much of the last few years, we have been able to hide our faces, to cover them with masks. And this perhaps has been helpful in some situations. I cannot tell you how many meetings I've been to when I had to yawn. And I was masked, so no one saw. Don't worry, none of these were Temple of Muna meetings. Not a one, all right, maybe like one or two. For some of, the ma for some of us, the masks were helpful because we didn't want people to see our full faces. Some of us are shy, and the masks made it easier to be with other people. I have to say that I'm still relearning what it's like to be with people without masks, sometimes with masks. And we should acknowledge how complicated it is to wear or not to wear. That is the question. How to balance the complexities around masking. How do we do that as a community, individuals, in all kinds of situations? It's quite complicated. Long before this pandemic, showing one space meant something powerful and maybe more straightforward. There's a reason why we have the expression poker face, because we don't want the other card players to know that we just have a three and an eight. You don't want to reveal your hand or your true feelings. To show one's face, to really show one's face, is to make oneself vulnerable. It allows someone to see through the exterior walls we build and to say, this is me. This is who I am. 
and this is what I'm feeling. When we show our face, someone can call our bluff or even take advantage of us. To show our face means to take a risk. When I think of the yearning to see a face, to see the ultimate face, I'm called back to Moses on Mount Sinai. Although he's been basking in this aura of the divine presence for weeks, Moshe still feels lonely. He's still missing something. And so he asks God, can I see your kavod? Now, what is kavod? It's not entirely clear. It's usually translated as presence. Moshe wants to see God's presence. But like most Hebrew words, there are many layers, many different connotations. The root of kavod from the word kaved, meaning heavy, weightiness, importance, essence. So Moses is asking God to see who God really is. God replies that Moshe can see God's tuv, God's goodness, which again, we're not sure what that is. Maybe it's the way that God models moral and ethical behavior in this world, and, and we're supposed to emulate that. Moshe can see God's tuv, but Moshe cannot see God's face. It would overwhelm Moshe. It would kill him. But God allows a glimpse, telling Moshe, see, there is a place near me. Moshe, go over there and station yourself by the rock. And my kavod, and as it passes by, I will put you in the cleft of the rock and shield you with my hand until I have passed by. And then I'll take my hand away and you can see my back but you must not see my face. Now these are remarkable verses and we could spend a long time unpacking them. But suffice it to say, it's clear that humans cannot fathom the unfathomable. And similarly, let's bring it back to people. Sometimes we cannot see them fully. We cannot fully take in another person. It's far too intimate. It's too overwhelming. So we, we look away. To me, that's what's behind this narrative. Not only can we not know God, but we are also unable to see someone fully. And sometimes we don't allow others to see us. There's another passage in the Torah that relates to this idea. It's about the Ark of the Covenant. You probably know it from Raiders of the Lost Ark. But before that, it was a pretty famous place. On top of this Ark of the Covenant, which housed the two tablets of the Ten Commandments, were two cherubs. There were these two, we think of them as angelic beings, with these, sometimes they're portrayed in medieval paintings, with these young infant-like faces, and they're on top of the ark. Now, it should be noted that cherubs actually appear first, this word kruvim, back in the narrative I was discussing about Adam and Eve. And there, they're not so angelic. They're standing there with swords guarding the Garden of Eden, making sure that Adam and Eve cannot come back in after their exile. But whatever these kruvim, these cherubs were, it's clear that they were human in their appearance, that they had faces. And then, of course, there's a debate in the Talmud. Which way were these kruvim facing? Were they facing in towards each other, or were they facing out? It's one of our most fun things to do as Jews. The Talmud loves this. Let's debate which way they're facing. And in classic Talmudic fashion, or if you like Tevye fashion, you're right, and you're right. They were facing both in and out. How could this be? When the people were following God's commandments, they faced towards each other. 
And when things went awry, they turned away from each other. And the Torah also teaches that God's voice, the place where we can hear God's, God's teachings, if you will, feel God's presence most intensely, is right between these two kruvim, is right between these two cherubs. We learn that when we're following the tradition, when we are treating each other with kindness and compassion, it's represented by the two kruvim looking at each other, by when we look at each other. And in that space, in that space between the look, that's where God can be found. That's where we can hear God. That's where we can feel God. There's a third moment where Moses encounters God that I want to bring up. It's Moshe's first encounter with the divine. Where does it happen? Burning bush. This is one of my favorite narratives. Moshe is called from the burning bush. First moment where God speaks to Moshe. And Moshe wants to see this awesome sight. But once he realizes what's going on, that he's standing on holy ground, that he has to take his sandals off, that the God of our ancestors, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob is speaking to him. He has to, to turn away. Moshe hid his face from glancing at God. He was afraid. He was afraid to look at God. This is another great word for looking. The habit or a mabat. A peeking at the Holy One. A mabat can be a quick glance. It's kind of like what we've had also for the last few years. Just our eyes. Just what I can see right now. Eyes peeking above the mask. But we're actually also wired as human beings to see one's eyes. We can see what someone else is seeing by following their eyes. We can see what they're looking at. So it's no accident that we quickly adapted to communicating with our eyes. We've evolved to appreciate the smallest changes so that we can tell if someone's smiling, even if they're wearing a mask. Our eyes pick up on the most subtle nuances. We can see the micro expressions just from someone's eyes. And think of the great Roman statesman, Cicero, who 2,100 years ago said that the eyes are the windows into the soul. Not only do our eyes reveal, not only do our eyes allow us to see others, they also reveal what lies within us. For some of us, it's been hard to return to full faces. A week ago, I was talking with a little toddler, and she kept walking behind her mother's leg over and over again. I was just trying to, like, smile at her. Didn't have a mask on. It's outside. And her mother explained that people's faces sometimes overwhelmed her toddler, saying she's a COVID baby. While this often happens with young people seeing new people, especially grown-ups, I think that these COVID years have only served to intensify that feeling. It can be hard to see the whole face. I've come to really appreciate those moments where I do get to see someone's face, fully feeling that intensity. But I've come also to understand that it's also wondrous just to see someone's eyes, just a glance of their face. That can help us overcome 
loneliness of existence. And while we can never fully know God or each other, we can still appreciate the magic of a glimpse of a mabat or glance. Sometimes that's all we can get. Those glimmers, they're amazing. The face of another, even just the eyes of another, they can warm our soul. So I don't want to just leave you on the beach, you know, and I'm out there flailing in the water. Finally, I got above the waves. And there in the distance, I caught a glimpse of my son Ari. He was standing on the beach watching my, my lack of progress in the water. But his mabat, his seeing me, changed everything. I wasn't any closer to the shore, but I felt calmer. Once I knew that someone could see me, and in this case, my, my own son, I knew I would be okay. I started swimming in a kind of zigzag pattern, and behind me, a large wave, this time pushed me ashore. Sometimes we just need to see another's face. May this be a year where our faces can be turned towards each other as we support each other, draw one another closer. Shana Tovah.